Hello, and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 54, Gateway Games, the next generation. Putting Catan to rest and talking about modern gateway games. From Hamilton, Ontario, I'm Sean, and as always, live from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Moti. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to welcome everyone in the t- here in the lobby on Twitch. We start live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop and continue on even after the double bell for more off the books after show. For those of you who aren't here live, you can listen in on that after show by joining our Patreon. As thanks for supporting us, you also get other stuff like access to our private Discord channel where you can chat with us and other fans of the show, pre-production show notes, behind the scene blog posts, and more. So in addition to talking about gateway games today, I have finally launched the Zentico review and giveaway we've been teasing for way too long. And I'm going to be talking about both Dungeons Cabal and Sorcerer at some new player counts. And I finally got some DC Deck Builder back on the table. Nice to hear your gaming again. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some feedback we've received, comments on our content, and maybe some gaming discussions we've been part of. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions. And if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. You can also hit us up on social media where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Up first, a comment on our latest Gloomhaven video. Uh, This was for scenario number 64, the Underwater Lagoon. Fabian Gret writes... Every scenario for us, it's like, we're not going to make it. And mega super close win on the last turn. Well, thanks, Fabian. We've been seeing that quite a lot often from the Bellhops group as well. It seems like during about the second room, they've all but given up hope, Mm -hmm. but keep pushing through and then they edge out a win in the end. Yeah, it's it's Tori's trust in us, I think, is what keeps (laughs) us going to the end. If Tori says we're doomed, then we're usually actually in trouble. But he's usually the one that is uh, very much uh, the the optimist of our group. Well, now Matthew commented on our Raiders of the North Sea review. I saw this game today while I was out looking for Champions of Midgard. In your opinion, which one is better? I've played Champions of Midgard, but I have to admit it, it was much like Lords of Waterdeep. I did like the press your luck dice rolling, though. Thank you. Uh, Thanks for the comment, Matthew. Now, I do own both games. Uh, I still have both in my collection, so that'll say one thing. But the one thing I didn't like about Champions of Midgard is actually with the press your luck aspect. You can spend turns and turns and turns building up your forces, collecting all kinds of dice and making this huge raiding party, only to go out on a raid roll badly and lose absolutely everything you built up where you literally gain nothing for what you just did for the last five turns. Now that never happens at Raiders of the North Sea. When you launch a raid, you get the plunder no matter what. Now there are some raids where dice are involved, but they only affect the victory points you get. You always get the plunder. So even on a bad roll, you still get something. To me, that alone makes Raiders a more fun game. And if you check out my the review and read through it, there's a lot of other things I also really like about Raiders. And just overall, I'm actually at the point where I'm considering selling my copy of Champions of Midgard because they are very similar games, especially thematically. All right, up next, it seems someone found our Masters of the Universe review. That is a role-playing game from FASA. And stop right now. Yes, I said FASA. Yes, I said Master of the Universe. And someone out there is like, oh my God, I gotta have it. Just stop. Eric Indigo commented on the review itself to say, It's unfortunately true. It's incoherent. Thanks for this advice. The pieces are fun, but one would have to use an actual solo RPG like Four Against Darkness to make use of them. Well, thanks, Eric. See, we're not the only ones. Really, do not buy this turd. Now, last but not least, we've got an amusing comment on our last podcast episode where we talked about how to pick what games to play. Stuntman on Plusporo wrote, 
Someone should make a board game about picking a board game to play with your group. <laughs> well, thanks, Stuntman. No, what's interesting, though, is I've already got a board game to determine who the start player is. I have got another board game to play with a tiebreaker, and both are from Bezier Games. So, hey, Bezier, are you listening? Because where's our pick-a-game game? Because it's right up your alley. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Thanks to everyone who shares, comments, and interacts with our content. We're here live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern on Twitch, and we love people who drop in and take part in our chat room in the lobby. If you're here live, we continue the show after the double bell in an off-the-books after show. Now, we're talking a lot about, uh, well, how much Mo might look like Mario for Halloween, Mexican <laughs> coffee, and RPGs, uh, specifically PDF RPGs, and the vast quantities yes. that, uh, that some people like our bellhop, have. <laughs> hey, I am sure you even have a collection of RPG I PDFs. Do. I do. Not anywhere near that size. No. <laughs> but yes, yes, I do. Yes. I, the, the biggest thing, know how my biggest growth of that collection happened was Ben Gerber used to run a group on G+. He, he ran the biggest board game group, but they also had tabletop gamers and other tabletop gamers, role players. And every year he did a charity auction, which was the Wayne Foundation, which always made me think Batman. For some reason, I have no idea why. Um, but it's and, actually sex trafficking of uh, yes. children. Completely different. Though something <laughs> Batman would also be absolutely. To, yep. So yep. I guess there is still a tie in there. But anyway, he used to run this charity thing, and he used to do these deals where you donated ten dollars to the Wayne Foundation and would get two to five hundred PDFs. Like it was insane. So that's where a big bulk of it came from. Is is supporting charity. So I really having that big a collection, if I'm actually supporting a good cause, I don't feel so guilty about it. Fair enough. So now as we move on, as we alluded to at the top of the show, we are going to be talking gateway games. But I don't want to hear about the same tired old games everyone always mentions. What I want to know from our chat room is if there's a new game you've discovered in the last year or so that you found to be a great game for introducing new gamers to our hobby. We'll be back, stopping by the lobby a few more times throughout the show. We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night question. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way for us to get questions is through the website. By the way, they don't get lost, they don't get missed. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Today's topic is inspired by a question we received from Mr. Uncle Awesome over on the Tabletop Bellhop blog. They wrote, What is your favorite newish game to play with people just getting into the hobby after games like Catan and Ticket to Ride? Well, first off, thanks, Mr. Uncle Awesome, for the question. Now, when I first got this question, it seemed like something we basically had already answered, right? We blog posts and uh, podcasts on Next Step Games from Catan specifically. We did another one on great games to hook new gamers. And when I got the question, I re just replied to it in email and linking those two posts, but something just stuck in the back of my head. And it was the part where Mr. Uncle Awesome said newish. Well, we here at the Tabletop Bellhop aren't exactly known for being on the bleeding edge of newness. <laughs> More like the trailing edge or following along in a baggage caravan? Yeah, we, we often say we are not about the new hotness. But you know what? Tonight we are going to be because you know what? Most gateway games, like the gateway games everyone talks about are quite old. If you Google what are the best gateway games or what are the best games to hook people, even my own list have a bunch of old games on them. And sometimes you don't realize how old these games are. Like Catan has been around since 1995. That's like a quarter of a century ago. Survive Escape from Atlantis is even older. It came out in 1982. That's probably older than most people listening to this show. Uh, Carcassonne's from the year 2000. And Ticket to Ride, everyone thinks of as this shiny new game. That came out in 2004. So not surprisingly, we've thoroughly covered all of those. Yeah. I mean, 20-year-old games, that's bread and butter for us. Yeah, like I said, that's, normally we are not about the new hotness, but... That's where I thought this did fit in, because I know there are great modern games out there that are just as good, if not better, than the classics for introducing new gamers to our wonderful hobby. Now, straight up, I am not trying to knock the classics. 
many of those older games are still excellent games. I still own them. I still enjoy playing them. Heck, at our launch party, we played a big Catan game and had a lot of fun doing it. But I thought it'd be time to consider a new, more modern set of gateway games. That's right, folks. We're looking at modern games that are still available for purchase. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this would be one of the cases where I'm not going to get any nasty emails saying, stop talking about games that cost $800 on Amazon. Oh. Now, what follows is going to be a list of games that have come out in the last three years that we think are excellent gateway games, great games for introducing people to the world of hobby board games. All right, number one, we could probably do an over-under if people are going to predict this game being mentioned on our podcast, because, you know, we never talk about it. Uh, that is, of course, Azul. Uh, this came out in 2017. Anyone who's been following this content for even like one episode could probably expect this to be at the top of the list. It's a fantastic, easy to teach, tile laying game. There's a lot more going on than pretty pieces and bright colors. I have found very few people who don't do Azul. And that includes gamers and gamers alike. Plus, I find the abstract nature of the game actually finds it very approachable to non-gamers because non-gamers are often scared off by highly thematic and complex looking games. Yeah, so I learned this game in 15 minutes on a small round at a coffee shop. It's just that easy to bring new people into this game. Yes, I've, I've got some board game XP under my, uh, uh, under my belt, but still, mm. I mean, you know, so I call it half an hour at a, you know, at a, at a board game event. And it's still a really easy teach for anyone. Yeah, and that was Azul. And just a note for our moderator, is it possible for you to grab the list of games I see streaming by in our chat room to throw them at the end of our topic so we can give off a list of what our chat room came up with? Up next is Sagrada. This also came out in 2017, and it's probably why you hear Azul and Sagrada compared so often. Uh, this is another abstract crafting game that I would say is a step up from Azul in complexity and just a step more difficult to learn. Maybe even half a step, but just a little bit more complex. Uh, and Sagrada players are drafting dice using them to build a stained glass window. Dice need to be placed on a grid so that no dice of the same color or number are next to each other. In addition, you're trying to match a specific pattern with each player, which is determined at the start of the game. Now, the one thing that I actually think may bump Sagrada over Azul for if you're just looking to collect a new gateway game for your group is replayability. There are more random elements in Sagrada, including selecting starting patterns, uh, which tools are in play, and which scoring cards comes up. And a strategy that works in one game may not work at all in the next game, whereas I find Azul, now that I played it a lot of times, does start to feel kind of samey, like people have their preferred type of strategy in it. Yeah, this is a great game, and that randomness can really be a key for new players. It can be daunting to sit down with an old pro who may know all the angles and best moves of a game, like Carcassonne or Catan, <laughs> but with Sagrada, there are just too many potential patterns. So everyone starts off <laughs> that little bit more evenly. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Sagrada, that, that random factor is a really nice touch that also keeps the game fresh. Uh, up next is a newer one. Uh, you've heard me talking about this an awful lot the last few weeks. And that is Go Cuckoo. Uh, this was released on Easter 2016. Uh, oddly enough, it was branded as an Easter game. You were supposed to buy your kids as an Easter gift. Uh, I can honestly say I have yet to find a person who did not enjoy this great dexterity game from Haba. I played it with kids. I played it with adults. I played it with gamers. I played it with people who don't like board games. As I wrote in my review, Go Cuckoo has proven to be pretty much universal in its appeal. Another aspect I like about Go Cuckoo is that it's great for showing people that board games aren't all about dice cubes and cards. It's a great example to show off the genre of dexterity games to players who may not even know that that exists. Yeah, this is uh, one we I think we've probably said a lot, a lot on recently, but again, a board game doesn't have to have a board. Very true. But I should be using tabletop game. That's why I prefer the term tabletop game to board game usual. But usually, that's why we stick to that. And that was Go Cuckoo. Up next, another game we've talked about quite a bit. That is Gizmos. This is newer than the other games I've mentioned. This came out in 2018, last year. Uh, this is a fantastic game to introduce a new gamer to the concept of engine building. Because the entire point of Gizmos is to build a point-scoring engine, one Gizmo card at a time. 
Uh, it also teaches players about tableau building, which is a very popular mechanic in much more complicated games. Not only that, but everyone I've taught this game really latches on to the science fair theme of it. That just seems to draw people in. I say, oh, you're starting off with all you got is your workbench. Where are you going from there? Uh, now, all of that says nothing about the table presence, because that marble-filled energy dispenser always catches people's eyes. And every time I've broken this game out at a public event, someone comes over to say, hey, what are you playing? Yeah, now I think this game is one, while, yes, the table presence is undeniable, and we've talked about this a number of times mm -hmm. uh, for uh, public events, uh, this is one where I think experienced gamers will st or a are able to stomp all over mm -hmm. beginners. Um, but if you can get a group of beginners together playing yeah. it and teach them, but not necessarily play with them, it's a fantastic game. You just have to watch out that if you get one beginner in with uh, yeah. a group of advanced players, they will probably get routed. <laughs> yeah, that is definitely true. Uh, that is a game that it takes a game or two to really get the flow of that game. And there's always a eureka moment as part of Gizmos, which actually I find very appealing based on the theme is where you're playing and you're like, oh, and you see that the player you're playing with gets it. And then you almost want to stop then and start over and be like, all right, now let's play for real because now you get how this is all going to interact. But it's definitely true. System mastery in that game is going to beat out a new player probably every time. And I love the idea of teaching others to play. It's just I'm selfish. So I would just sit down and say, you guys are playing for a second. I'm going to win, but you can challenge me next time. That was Gizmos. Up next, King Domino, going back to 2016. Uh, pretty much everyone knows what dominoes are two-part tiles that when you play them have to match one side to one of the tiles already in play. King Domino takes that basic comment, concept, adds in drafting and area scoring. Players start turns drafting landscape tiles, put them into their personal kingdom. At the end of the game, after the last tile is drafted, you score your kingdoms. Uh, that's based on having terrain types grouped together. Uh, it's a dead simple teach and plays in under 15 minutes. Yeah, you know, even after a couple of drinks, most people can at least get the hang of playing this one, though the scoring might slow down a little bit at the end. Yeah, scoring is a little harder than that. That's another one. Because it's so short, I like to play that one twice as well. So you play it once and everyone gets the concept of how to play the tiles, but then you play the second time once they understand how to score the tiles. And that was King Domino. Up next is a modern card game called The Mind. This one just came out last year, uh, sold out every day at Origins when we were there. We tried to get a copy. It was impossible to get. They air freighted more and they sold out in the first 10 minutes every day. This is really just a simple deck of cards numbered 1 to 100 with a couple little bonus add-ons. Every player gets a hand of cards. Players can play their cards at any time. There's no turns. And the goal is to play all the cards in everyone's hands, but they have to be played in order. Sounds really simple, right? Hey, you've got a three, I've got a four. You play first. Well, the thing is, you cannot communicate with one another in any way as to which cards you hold. Okay, sure, there's a couple more rules, like there's rules for throwing stars, but the basic concept behind the mind is play your cards in order and don't talk about it. People have no idea how fun this game is until they try it. Just forget the whole debate over whether it's a game or an activity, and just have fun playing the mind. Yeah, there's a reason why this game has a laundry list of awards behind it. Now, that being said, there are also a strong number of people who are haters, and they are mm -hmm. very vocal about it. Uh, and if you actually read through the reviews, one of the reasons that this has the rating it has on Board Game Geek is some significantly toxic yes. one rating. Um, you know, people are just are just rape, rating bombing, rating bombing it. So, you know, just be aware that it may not be for everyone. Um, but please try and make your make up your own mind and uh, don't just listen to the the random people spewing uh, vitriol about what is uh, by most uh, conceits a really good game yeah. or activity or activity <laughs> <laughs> one or the other. Yes. Make up your own mind about the mind. Yeah. Uh, next, I have Robo Rally. Okay, I am talking specifically about the 2016 version. I realize the game's way older than that. And personally, I actually much prefer the older editions of Robo Rally. But the new edition was put out almost as a kid's game, released by Hasbro in bright colored packaging, and was made more accessible and easier to teach. In this version of the classic programming game, every player has their own deck of cards instead of sharing a deck. Uh, upgrades are bought from a central market with PowerPoints, very similar to 
of Tokyo. Counters and damage and locks, all of that's now all damage is by adding bug cards to your deck. And timing, instead of being based on all kinds of weird rules and having rules for virtual robots, is now just about where you are on the board. I am a huge fan of Robo Rally overall, and I think this edition is a great introduction to program movement games. So once you get people hooked, I do suggest you switch to one of the older editions that are a little more complicated. Yeah, I would have never considered Robo Rally a gateway game, but then I've never played this newer version, so uh, I'll defer to the bellhop here. Yeah, it's definitely, there's a lot of the aspects that make the other one complicated that are removed from this one. And it's marketed at a younger audience, even seeing it. It's plastic color pieces. It's it's more cartoony looking. Uh, it very much looks kind of like Ghost Fighting Treasure Hunters. It's got that kind of vibe going on. That was Robo Rally, but just the 2016 edition. Lotus is up next. This is a card game from 2016. Every player gets their own deck of cards, each which represents a flower petal, each of the cards, uh, from one of five flowers. Each turn, players play one or two petals from their hand, trying to complete full flowers. Each flower type requires a different set of petals, starting with three petals for an iris, up to seven petals for a lotus. Now, in addition, players play guardians, which are represented by little wooden meeple bugs, like there's a caterpillar and there's a butterfly and that. They're very cute. Uh, and you're going to put those onto the developing flowers. And then they're going to score points when the flowers are completed using area majority. Whoever has the most guardians is going to score the points for the completed flower. Uh, Lotus is one of the most beautiful games in my collection. Fairly simple to teach, but just that step above, say, like a casual card game. It's got enough little gamer elements in there that I think it's a great gateway game. Now, this one seems to sometimes suffer from an imbalance where a poor player can hand it off to a more skilled player and kind of throw things off. Is that something you've seen in your plays or? Uh, to be honest, it has been a while since I played it. But what I have seen happen is people get too focused on completing the flowers and you don't score for completing flowers. You score from having guardians on completed flowers. So if people are more worried about just filling in the flowers, but they're doing it where other people have the guardians. Yes. Yeah, so an inexperienced player could complete. You could have all your guardians on a thing and they finish it for you. Right. So I could see how that's actually an issue. But I think it's just a matter of when you teach the game, explaining what the focus is. That, yes, making the beautiful flowers is nice, but the way you get points is by putting your bugs on the flowers. Right. Uh, that was Lotus. Up next is probably the newest game on the list, and that is Chocolatiers. Uh, this card drafting tile lane game just came out at Origins. Um, I don't even think it was released to the public when I got a copy of it. It was given to me for review purposes. Uh, so far, Chocolatiers has proven to be an excellent, easy-to-teach filler game with a deceptive level of depth. This is one of those games where you start playing and you have an oh moment. And then three turns later, you have an oh moment. And then you're like, oh, at the end of the game. Uh, this is from the designer of Valeria Card Kingdoms. And despite being a very different game and both style and gameplay is just as excellent. Uh, players are chocolatiers using chocolate cards and reserving boxes of chocolates, trying to produce the best chocolate sampler they can. Yeah. Now we talked about this one uh, a little bit last time and how some of the possibilities that it may not really have a lot of long term playability for for the for the hardcore hobby gamers. But that being said, it really is a fantastic intro game and maybe mm -hmm. worth having in your collection if that's the uh, the kind of game you, you find yourself in or kind of find, position you find yourself in, having to bring new people in or teach new people, it, it might just fill, fill that niche nicely. That was Chocolatiers from Daily Magic Games. Uh, up next, Copenhagen from Queen Games came out 2019. I'm not sure if it came out at Origins, but they were definitely showing it off at Origins. Uh, pretty sure it was released then. Now, I'll admit, I did this up. I found it too light for my personal tastes, but I do think it would be an awesome gateway game. In Copenhagen, players are drafting cards, very Ticket to Ride style, which they're going to use to buy polyomino. So you put in three red cards to get a three square polyomino. You put in six blue cards to get a six square polyomino. You're going to use those to build apartment buildings, very Tetris style. Like uh, you can't have a free floating brick. They would fall down. Um, points are awarded for completing rows and columns with bonus points awarded if the row or column is full of windows. Uh, there are some bonus tiles that have special actions that can be gained as well. Now, I have seen this game go over really well with a wide mix of players. Um, 
I didn't get it at Origins, but while I was there, Chris Nizak bought a copy, and he kept bringing it out to events and playing it in front of me, and everyone he taught it to seemed to be really digging it. Um, he then brought it out again at QCC, and again, people seemed to really be digging it. Um, it seems to be going over well enough in public play that I somewhat regret not picking up a copy just to bring out to stuff like our easy mode game nights where we're expecting new gamers. Now they already have uh, both a deluxe and a roll and write yep. version of this game. Uh, what, what are your feeling on roll and rights when it comes to, to gateway games and intros? Possibly. I don't know. I'm not a huge fan of them so far. Uh, the best one I played was railroad Inc. I now played three times and by the third time it felt very much the same as the first time. So a great way to introduce someone to a game, but no real staying power to me. Um, I haven't done, um, what is it? Uh, Gone Sean Clever or Doppel Clever, Twice as Clever. I can't remember. Those are the two big ones from Stronghold. I haven't tried those. I haven't tried Welcome to. There's a huge movement in the industry right now towards roll and rights. It's not a style of game that I'm really immediately drawn to. Now, I do really dig the old Through the Ages. That was pretty good. I don't know. I have no idea how Copenhagen would be as a roll and write. It's it's not really a, a genre I've really dived into enough to have much more of an now, the deluxe, all that does is it replaces the cardboard tiles with acrylic, and they're semi-transparent. It looks pretty, but it really doesn't change the functionality at all. And personally, I, I, I know someone who won a copy of them at Origins, and I'm like, I'd be happy to win a copy of them, but I can't see buying a copy of them. Right. It wasn't, it wasn't a game, especially a quick filler game, right? You only play 15 minutes. Like, if I want a deluxe game, give me a three-hour game, mm-hmm. and I'm going to be touching the pieces for a long time. Yep. Uh, that was Copenhagen. Uh, another game that um, Chris Nizak ended up picking up, and I can't seem to find, and that is Planet. This came out in 2018. Uh, I can't seem to get a copy of this one. Uh, yes, I'm sure it's available on Amazon right now, but every time I have the money and I'm somewhere I can buy it, they don't have copies available anymore. Like when I was at Origins, and like when I was at Hugo Immune, or not, sorry, the CG Realm the other day, and was actually looking to buy a game. Uh, the fact this game keeps selling out, to me, is a good indicator of how good it is. Now, in Planet, everyone's building their own planet. It's represented by a large magnetic 12-sided die thing. Uh, Each turn, players are going to draft tiles. These tiles have various terrain features on them. There's mountains, ice, forest, desert, water, I think are all of them, five of them. Um, And then each of these tiles can have like five different spots that are a mix of those different terrain types. You then put them on your D12. And then as the game goes on, you eventually start trying to attract animals to your planet based on things like you have the most deserts or you have the most forests that aren't touching mountains and other things that are based on these terrain features. Uh, You're going to get points um, for the animals you've collected, and then you're also going to get points for having terrain types. Uh, This is another game that really seems simple when you first start playing. Yeah, yeah, I'm drafting stuff. But once you start playing, some hidden depth is revealed. Uh, it's way more than of a thinker. Like once you start getting the animals, you have that ooh moment, and there's a lot more to it than it first looks like. Yeah, the the multilingual and foreign editions came out in 2018. Yeah. The English only release didn't happen until April of this year. Oh, okay, for, for Planet uh, or Earth Day, sorry. Earth Day, uh, that's right. Now this is a fantastic gateway game, and and first time players never have anything negative to say about it. But I am concerned with a lot of what I'm seeing that the gimmick of the dodecahedron gets old and makes playing frustrating because you're constantly asking the other players to turn their dodecahedron around so that you can see what they're up to and keep track of what the other players are doing so that your strategy is working. I I guess I, I haven't played it enough to really know because again I can't seem to find a copy. <laughs> but I don't you don't have to see the other players playing it. They just have to answer you honestly. You just go how much ice do you have and they tell you. Well, but, but I I guess, mean, again, I, it's, you know, if everyone's trying to sort of keep everything in their yeah. mind, it's easier, to, it's easier to look. And, and, you know, in most games, you can glance over another player. Yeah, this is a player board and, and see what's going on. Whereas this, you actually have to ask those questions or ask yeah. them to turn it around or, or whatever. Um, and, and so as fantastic as a gimmick is and as much as it really gets the, the feeling of planet across, uh, you know, again, some people are saying that it, it gets frustrating after a while. So the other thing, though, is I find the planet really makes your brain think a different way for yourself, not even worrying about the other players. Like once you, I can see that complaint, but having the ball and trying to rotate it to count your own. So there's something about that that adds a new level to the game that you don't get from anything else. 
And I actually really like that aspect of, oh, wait, where do I have that? Oh, I thought I had a late going. Like, just focusing on your own. And I well, think it's... that's part of the fact that I haven't played it that much, is I'm still at the point, like, even when you first learn Azul, all you're worried about is where your own tiles are. And then you get to that next level of Azul where you're, like, worrying about where the opponent's tiles are. And you get to that third level of Azul where it's often more about what the other players are doing than what you're doing. And I think Planet may have that, where I'm still at the looking at my own ball for it. Yeah, no, I did, there's definitely something about the geometry of it and the fact that you're, you, you can't replicate that properly on a flat yeah. surface. Like, there's a reason they went to this shape, and it, it makes sense both thematically and as a, you know, as a concept. But again, because it's a game where you do need to eventually, once you get into the, the rhythm of it, start paying attention to what other players are doing, it's just that, that little problem aspect. Yep. If I can ever find a copy, I'll tell you if we've ever run into that problem ourselves. And yes, like I said, I can probably go buy a copy full price, but I only buy games at certain times during the year, and at those times, I couldn't find a copy. That was planned. Uh, the final game on my list, uh, we mentioned this one surprising amount uh, on the show, which is weird, because I, I like it, I play it, I don't play it a lot. Uh, that is Kodama the Tree Spirits, which came out in 2016. Uh, in Kodama, you're building a tree but the tree is going to be a home for the tree spirits, Kodama. The goal is to build a tree that is the most healthy, lush, and appealing to the tree spirits you have. Players do this by drafting cards representing branches of the tree. Each card is going to have three features on it. These could be the same or different features. And they include things like stars, clouds, worms, mushrooms, flowers. I don't remember them all. I think there's like eight different ones. At the start of the game, though, you get a random set of Kodama cards, and these tell the players what their personal tree spirits want to see. And at the end of each season, you have to play one of those cards. So you kind of are trying to build to make those Kodama happy. So kind of neat tie into theme there. Um, now, the Kodama will want different things. Like one might want a tree with lots of branches that have tons of mushrooms, where another one wants a tree with as many flowers, but wants them close to the trunk and so on. Uh, Kodama is another game that just looks gorgeous on the table, and I find the theme really appeals to a lot of non-gamers. So just that the anime look to it, and anyone who's a Miyazaki fan is instantly drawn to this game. Well, and if you hold off a little bit, if you don't have a copy, there's a 3D version of the game that's already been through its mm -hmm. Kickstarter. It was it succeeded, finished in July, and he's planning on having copies of it at Essen in October. So it could be hitting the shelves uh, even by Christmas. See, that one, I don't know. That can't work as well as the cards, at least for your ability to build different things. I, I looked at that kit, sir. I considered it for how much I do date Kodama. And I, I got to admit, it seemed kind of gimmicky to me. That one, I'm going to be waiting for reviews to see how well it actually works. What's interesting is he actually had to shut the Kickstarter down at one point because there is a 3D printing company called Kodama 3D. Ooh. <laughs> and uh, he got it. He actually had to pause the Kickstarter, go into some negotiations of some yeah. sort. Uh, and then eventually the Kickstarter happened again. Yeah, always Google your name before going forward with your project. Well, I mean, he was locked in with Kodama, right? I mean, he's got yeah. he's got whatever for Kodama, but that adding that 3D apparently makes a big difference. Yeah. I think Kodama is actually like a Japanese word for tree spirit, too. Like, I don't think it's just the name of the game. Possibly, but the game is the only thing that comes up when I Google it. Oh, all right. um, so uh, in the lobby, we've had uh, Kat was mentioning uh, King of Tokyo and Bang the Dice game. Older. They're, they're not that. that well, not and that's actually one of the enough. problems. I think in the chat room, yeah. a lot of what we were seeing was everyone's go to gateway games are older, fresh. Exactly. Um, they're all they're all a little older. It, it's, uh, you know, again, partially because I think we've become hobby gamers we aren't looking for the gateway games right now. So Fair. we've all sort of graduated to more advanced games and may not even be aware of what those gateway games uh, are out right there right now. There's enough of those gateway games that I have a ton of fun with. Like how much fun are we having with Gokuku and how often have we played Azul recently, right? Sagrada Stew is great. There's a, there's very few, I'm going to admit, there's very few in that list that I've moved on from. Like Copenhagen is, is a perfect example of a game I played and went, nah, this is, just a little too simple for me. Right. So it does happen. So in some ways we moved on. Um, what else do we have? 
So uh, Major Kayla is mentioning Ruin and uh, Sword, and, Sword and Skull, which are definitely yeah, on those the older are side. Definitely old, yeah. Now code names, depending on which version, uh, that that comes I was going to say new. code names pictures. I almost put on the list. I, I was close. Code name pictures did come out in the last three years, and then saw Marvel and Harry Potter editions and that are new enough. Yeah. I considered it, but then I'm like, eh, code names is 2015. So yeah. I mean, I have I'll, to I'll, say, I'll code... give Major Kayla that one. Yeah, for for party games, I think code names is really a fantastic. Yeah. Uh, entry uh fire in the library for 2019 okay press your luck game uh didn't know that uh, one myself that's uh uh red meeple ryan has jamaica and favor of the pharaoh okay i don't know what happened with me in jamaica everyone seems to love this game i only played once it was at the green bean downtown so that kind of dates how long ago it was it was scott hewell's copy and i hated it like i really did not enjoy that game I don't know. I like Scott's a good game teacher, so I don't think it was a bad teach. Maybe we played with some like I don't remember who else was playing. I think we played four players. It, it's it's a race game with some push your luck aspects and you're fighting and there's some neat mechanics for what ships in order and how to fight. I don't I just didn't think, like it looked awesome. The entire game is a treasure chest and you open it up. That was really cool, but I did not like Jamaica, so I couldn't recommend that one. Uh, how many did you play with? I I think it was four. Okay. I I, I honestly, I said this. This is, goes back to the Green Bean downtown. So. All right. Interestingly, they they strongly recommend it as a six player game. Oh, uh, definitely on, not on board six. Game Geek. So it, yeah. it is. It is like the the. It might have been three. Over over and above the mo- the the six is the most highly recommended uh, player count on that. Okay. So yeah, that I could have been it. Like I, I almost feel like I should give it another shot, but I think Scott actually ended up selling it after that because i don't he didn't have a very good experience either so i remember he was excited he's like oh i got jamaica and i'm like all right what's jamaica he's like oh it's this race game and pirate race played it and i was like mm. and then i kind of looked at scott and scott's like did you enjoy that and i'm like no nah. he's like yeah i didn't really enjoy it either yeah apparently yeah so uh and Red, uh, ryan saying five player for jamaica is good enough uh yeah four five and six are the are the recommended and yeah, so i saying, think we might have done with three yeah and see one two and three are apparently are like two or two and three are just don't bother counts yeah so that that, so that may be what, what happened. happened with us if anyone locals got to make a bring it out to easy mode this weekend or the cg mo cg realm on the 24th i'll play it especially the 24th i'll have lots of time to game on the 24th and then uh Ancient games is curious what you think of new frontiers the race for the galaxy board game as a gateway game Oof, that's it's rough there's a lot that's a lot of action selections like you're picking, is there's more than Race for the Galaxy. Okay. So what? There's five in Race for the Galaxy. Add two more because now you have to worry about money because you don't have a hand of cards to use as money. Okay. Now buying and then having to look at that board of developments. No, I don't think so. That would just be overwhelming because like you have a board of every development in the game. So think of Race for the Galaxy with every development laid out in front of you, and going, all right, you have two bucks. What do you buy? Right. No, I can't see it. Now, I personally think it might be, as the um, teacher said, a good intro to Race for the Galaxy for a gamer who's played Puerto Rico, say, or something else with action selection or um, Quest of Valeria, maybe. But I don't I don't think straight off the bat. Right. All right. Well, that's going to wrap up our list of modern gateway games. Uh, and that's it for this week's Ask the Bellhop. If you'd like to read more gaming and game night topics like this, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click click on Gaming Advice. Uh, if you got questions for us, remember, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or just send an email directly to questions at tabletopbellhop.com. We keep growing with the support of fans like you. So if you haven't yet, please take a minute to subscribe, rate, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, share with your friends, whatever and wherever you find us, you can help us grow. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I send out an email recapping all the content we've released in the week previous, blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, and anything else we create, including contests. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com webpage and you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. A reminder that Saturday, August 24th, is our Extra Life warm-up event being hosted by the CG Realm here in Windsor, and I want all of you to attend. That could be in person at the CG Realm at... 
1311 Tecumseh Road East, where they'll be gaming from 10 a.m. till 10 p.m. Or it could be online right here on Twitch, where we will be streaming the entire event. For those of you listening to this on the podcast, that's at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. And we will not be recording this or putting it up on YouTube likely. So uh, come and join the live stream. Now, this is our first big fundraising effort of the year for Extra Life. This is our big push to get things moving, and we're going to be looking for your support. For more information on all of our 2019 Extra Life efforts and events, head over to WindsorExtraLife.com. It's live! We've been teasing for weeks now, but the Zantico review and giveaway is actually live right now at TabletopBellHop.com. If you're in a rush, you can head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on reviews to find the full review with the giveaway entry widget at the bottom. So here's the review. Zantico was published this year by a company also called Zantico. I know, it's confusing. Um, neither the designer or artist are credited anywhere that I could find. I checked their webpage, I checked Board Game Geek. Sorry, props to the designer, good game. I wish I knew your name, I give you a shout out. Uh, this is a portable abstract strategy game for two or three players that kind of reminds me of a cross of the super classic old game from ancient times, Nine Men Morris, and Connect Four. This is a very new game and very much under the radar, and yeah. frankly, I don't understand why. People should be raving about this, but the company itself isn't doing anything to help. They've got an Instagram account and they're posting a bunch ah. of silly memes about the yeah. game. And that's it. It's a one page web page with a YouTube uh, link to your, your unboxing yeah. and someone else's review and their Instagram account. Yeah. Uh, you don't, this is a good indicator of how Kickstarter has changed our industry. Any indie publisher nowadays uses Kickstarter. And with Kickstarter, besides your funding and everything else, comes hype. That is what this game is missing completely and what the producers did. This is an independent game that was produced by independent publishers, um, possibly even one person. That I couldn't even tell you. And there's no buzz, right? Like, uh, I will admit, the reason I have this review copy and the reason we're doing a giveaway is what they tried to do to promote their game. Uh, they obviously reached out to at least one other person because I can see their review on their website as well. And that might be it. Or they tried to pitch a bunch of people. They said, no, I don't know. Uh, so this is why if you're an independent publisher, I honestly say use Kickstarter no matter what, even if you can make the game now, just to get that buzz going, to get the word out. Or at least be like, I don't know, Board Game Geek, something. Like Sean said, the, and that Instagram account, just uh, don't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. As for the game, uh, the game comes in, or rather is, a synthetic leather rolled up case. And I should totally have it right here in front of me because we're on video, but it's in my van. Uh, this case is about 10 inches long and a bit under 2 inches in diameter when rolled up. It's snapped together by two straps. Uh, when you unsnap the straps, the case unrolls. The game board and rules are revealed. Uh, it's about 13 inches long, not counting the straps. The board you plan itself is about nine inches square. It is a by five of all connected by lines at every possible connection point. Um, then there's a zipper part that's kind of in the middle. It's at the end of the roll. Um, in that, there are 18 chips, six each of red, black, and light blue. So it's sort of like a rainbow version of Othello. And this is going to be terrible for the podcast, but Deanna was nice enough to go grab the game. So here it is, showing it off. I am unrolling a Zantico for our viewers here, and I'm going to unzip the pouch at the end to show off the pieces inside. If you really want to see this, though, all you got to do is check out our unboxing video. So the rules are printed right on the case, right next to the board, and are very simple. The goal is to get four of your tokens into a position on the board so they form either a line of four or a square. Players each get four markers. The game includes spares. Uh, in turn, players place one marker on the board. Once all markers have been placed, if no one wins, you move on to step two. Note that you can actually win during setup, which I thought was kind of interesting. Uh, in turn, step two, in turn, players each moves one of their markers on the board 
from the spot it's in over to an empty spot following the lines on the board. That's it. There's the whole game. There is one advanced rule noted, and all that is is in part one, instead of setting up your pieces, you set your opponent's pieces. Simple, direct, portable. It's a purse or glove box game that seems like everyone should have just sitting around ready, but you've probably never heard of it. No, probably not, though you're hearing about it now. Now, I gotta say, the first thing that struck me right away is the quality. Like, you can probably all see this, those of you watching the show. Uh, again, check out our unboxing video to see it if you're not watching live. Uh, this is a well-produced game. This case, which is the board, is that nice synthetic leather. I think it's called PU leather or whatever. It's the same stuff that Quiver comes from, the Quiver from Quiver time. Snap, zipper are solid, and the actual chips are nice thick plastic. Everything rolls up in a nice small package that's great for transportation. Now, the first time I played, my copy is Antico. We are out in Amherstburg for Canada Day. Dan and I were playing it while the kids were having fun at a splash pad. And that's when it struck me how perfect this game is for playing outside. While it's not waterproof, which I did confirm with the publishers, it is water resistant. So I didn't have to worry about it when my soaking wet kids came over splashing the game. And due to the fact it's all synthetic leather and plastic components, that means the game is easy to clean. So if it falls in the mud or gets covered in sand or it starts raining, you're not game's not going to be ruined. Yeah, no, yeah. it's it's just a solidly made simple. And again, that's but the part of the key is that it's simple, right? There aren't yeah. a lot of things to worry about. Sure, you've got some tokens that could conceivably get lost, but even those are pretty easy to replace if you need to. Plus, they give you six and you only need four. So even if you lose two tokens of each color, you're still good. Now, as for the gameplay, uh, it's solid. This is not a great, amazing, new, awesome game. It's not groundbreaking. It's not earth-shattering. But it's a solid and pretty enjoyable game. It's really a simple, abstract strategy game, like with a really old-school feel to it. Like, it's, it's going back to the chess checkers kind of feel. Like, to me, it kind of feels like I should have this wooden board with stone playing pieces. Or I should be sitting at a diner waiting for my early riser breakfast to show up and have this wooden pegboard with a bunch of uh, four different uh, golf tees in different colors and playing there while I'm waiting for my special to show up. Yep. No, absolutely. Uh, this is not the new hotness, but a solid back pocket game that you can fall back on at any time. Now, I mentioned it when I was describing the rules. You can lose during setup, which is kind of interesting, though it's really not going to happen if you're paying any attention. That's that cool Connect Four kind of feeling. Now, the problem my wife and I did find is that this can be a long game, like longer than you want. It, it can overstay its welcome if you're playing with two players. Because if you have two people who know the game well and who are taking time, really planning out their moves and planning ahead and playing defensively, you can get to basically an almost stalemate situation. Like with two players, the game comes down to who makes the first mistake. Like Deanna and I joked the first time we were playing, or sorry, the second time we played, but that first day, that this could be the game that never ends if you both played cautiously enough. Tic-tac-toe, but without the forced ending. Yeah, exactly. Now, what we did find on later plays that this game really shines with three players. Once you add a third player to the game, the game changes both tactically and strategically. Like for one, it was much easier to predict what our opponents were doing, but even more so there were ways to set up situations where you could force one of your foes to make a move or else they let the other person win, which I thought was a really neat flow. Uh, there's definitely more thinking and not once did we run into a game that just kept going on too long. Yeah, interestingly, uh, along with other limited details on the game in board, on Board Game Geek, again, the limited details on it everywhere. <laughs> yeah. Um, but on Board Game Geek, they only list it as a two player game. But the lone reviewer of the game does comment on how yeah. it's a better game with three. So. Oh, they noted it was a better game too. I, I'll admit I didn't read the other review because I didn't want to be biased by it. Now, I actually wrote Zentico about that's the company, not the game. I wrote Zentico about Zentico, um, about the two-player game problem and how, like, my wife and I were thinking, you know, if we got good at this, we could just play this forever. And they did have a couple of fixes, which they said they're planning on adding to their website sometime. Uh, one was to make it that 
once you make a move, your next move can't be to just move the piece back. So you can't just redo the same move over and over, which actually sounds pretty solid. Another suggestion was to play a set number of moves or at a time limit. And then if you hit that, the game's a draw. Eh, not a big fan of that. The final suggestion was to allow duplicate moves, but use the threefold repetition rule from chess, which is where if you do the same move three turns in a row, the other player can claim a draw if you do the same thing three turns in a row. Now, personally, I kind of like the, the you can't duplicate, like you can't just take back what you did the last turn, but really just find a third player. Overall, the game's decent. Um, it's simple enough my kids could play it. I played it with them. Uh, and I dig the abstract nature. As I mentioned when we were talking about good gateway games and the top of the episode, one of the things I like about abstract games is they don't scare away non-gamers because they don't look overwhelming. They look very approachable to non-hobby gamers. Now, I can admit, this is not something I'm going to be bringing out to a CG Realm gaming night. But I have had fun playing it now and then. But what I really dig about this game is that portable nature and durability. I just spent hours out in the county this afternoon with my kids on a splash pad. We brought Sentico with us. Uh, if you're going to be playing outdoors, you're going to a beach and so on. You you have this game. Like my copy, well, Deanna just brought it in, but this was in the back of my van sitting with my ping pong paddles and our Frisbee. And that's where it's going to live. Now, you can find a full version of this review, including an unboxing video, over at TabletopBellhop.com. Along with that review, you can find our giveaway. We are giving yeah. away one copy of Zentico to one person, and this contest is open worldwide. Now, under the review, you'll find a raffle copter widget thing, and there's a ton of ways to enter. I would love it if you did absolutely all of them, but basically all we're asking you to do is follow our content. Most of you probably already do that already. So, you already follow me on Twitter, there's an entry. You follow, you like our Facebook page, there's an entry. Uh, those of you listening to the podcast, though, are going to get a special five bonus entries by going to the Rafflecopter, finding the bonus entry section, and entering the code rolled up. R O L L E D U P, all one word. I don't care if it's uppercase or lowercase. And as an added bonus for those of you here live right now in our chat room, I've entered another five entry code into our lobby chat right now. And that is my thoughts on Zentico by Zentico, designed by Zentico, art by Zentico. <laughs> and now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit the table? Uh, every week, we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we've attended, and any other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of this week in review at tabletopbellhop.com under uh, on our tabletop. Now, I've only got two games this past week, um, besides Zentico, to talk about hobby games, more hobby games here. Uh, these are both games I brought home from Origins, and both which I got to try at new player counts. And I got back to the table with a couple of new-to-me expansions for the DC Deck Builder system. So last Monday, Sean Hamilton, no, not Sean from Hamilton, was over, and I got Dead Man's Cabal to the table for a second time. Now, I played Dead Man's Cabal once before at one of our easy mode game nights. Now, I enjoyed that first play, and I've been looking forward to playing it again. Now, the big difference this time was that it was a three-player game, uh, Sean, Deanna, and I, and there are some changes made when you play with less than the full player count. Um, all of these involve just having less stuff in play. You put full, fewer skulls on the sepulcher and or however you pronounce that word and fewer runes on the scriptorium. Other than that, gameplay is identical. No weird special rules. While it's common to see alternative setups for two player games, it is a little on the odd to see one for three, even if it's just a minor adjustment. Yeah, and this actually adjusts further with two. So there's even less stuff on the board if you play two player, which I haven't tried yet. Uh, this game played great three players. Um, I would say, well, I, if not, possibly slightly better than with four players. Uh, for one, having fewer skulls available during the draft made the biggest difference because we were much more limited on our options each turn. Like there were turns I really wanted to take the gold skull action, but had no gold skulls and no way to get them. Uh, we didn't see that when we played four players. I'm still really digging the action selection mechanic in Dead Man's Cabal. And I got to say that I've grown to really like the whole private action followed by a public action mechanic. Now, at first, like when I first played, I was thinking it's just the lead, I lead you follow mechanic, 
for games like Race for the Galaxy, Eminent Domain, Puerto Rico, but this is actually quite different. Now, another thing I found was having played before, I could teach the game better, which makes sense, right? Because I played before, I'm going to teach it better. But there was one specific thing in this game that I think needs to be explained to new players, and that is how important the Oracle board is and how much final scoring is impacted by the Oracle board and how that determines the winner of the game. Now, I talked about this during my first thoughts. We talked about, I think it was last week, might have been two weeks ago. I can't remember off high end. But the Oracle board is how most of the end game points are rewarded. And it's unique that it's its own little mini game. It's an, excuse me, an area majority mini game. By using the proper runes when you raise the dead, you get to place cubes on this board. And on the board is a bunch of spots. And all the spots are different end game scoring systems. Player who has the most cubes on a spot gets the maximum points for that thing. Then the player with the second most cubes is going to get half that many points, and any other players get nothing. And there's spots for who used the most black skulls when somebody, who used the most white skulls when somebody, who used the most gold skulls when somebody, who used the most red skulls when somebody, who um, has the most runes, has the most skulls left at the end of the game, and at least two others. There's eight total things that you could be playing this weird little mini game for. And it is really opaque the first time you play. You just will not see this. It is not clear how much this weird little bidding area control part of the game actually impacts your final score. It's one of those aspects of many a larger and more complex game that really requires focus, but it's again, it's easy to get distracted from. Yes. When there are so many actions possible, but most of them don't directly give you victory points, you can forget that one important one over there that's the one yes. that actually helps you win the game. Yeah, very true. Because, like, for example, if you're not on the Oracle that is, I'm going to get points for the most skulls left at the end of the game, you probably don't want any skulls left. And it's really easy to go, oh, I'm just going to get lots of skulls, so I have lots of options. Well, if you're not winning in that Oracle bid for the most skulls, you're wasting your time. Now, both Deanna and Sean had not played before. Um, both seemed to like it. Uh, Deanna, in particular, was surprised by how much she enjoyed it. Uh, she can probably explain more in the chat, but she had taken a look at this game at Origins 2019 and actually watched a demo while I was begging Jonathan Gilmore to give me a review copy. Uh, but she didn't actually play it. She just watched the re watched this demo and she didn't, I got to admit, she didn't think much of it. And she noted while we were playing that there is a lot more to the game than it first appears. Now, overall, I am looking forward to a few more plays. Uh, you can expect to find a few review on the blog. I don't know if it'd be this week, maybe next. Um... I got to say, it's pretty obvious, I think, at this point, but unless we have some kind of terrible burn experience over the next couple of weeks, this is going to be a pretty positive review. Now, how are you finding uh, gameplay time? I'm just wondering about uh, analysis paralysis and, and stretched out game time as you get into the later stages. I've seen seen some talk about it, but nothing. I have the games we played, I think, were about an hour and a half, which to me is that kind of sweet spot for a medium to heavier game. It's not heavy. I, I would say it's a medium, a, a bit above medium, a medium heavy game leaning towards medium. Uh, that hour and a half time is pretty good. I think our first game might have went two hours with four players. Uh, the AP didn't seem to be that bad. Like I could see it just because that action selection system is a little weird. I could see the first time people play, it takes a bit to get it, but I haven't seen it myself. But again, I've only played twice. So, right. I, I apparently, I guess the box says 60 minutes. Uh, BGG. Okay. Is saying, so this is longer. BGG is saying 60 to 90, but yeah. I, apparently the box seems to say 60 minutes and people are kind of wishing it was that a little bit tighter and, and, and closer Ooh. to that 60 than the 90. But again, yeah, see, you know, I'll, I'll admit opinion. ours have been around nine. Ours have been around. Nine. To me, that's a sweet spot. For me. Like I like games are an hour and a half. That to me, that's about the perfect game because once it gets to an hour game, it's almost at filler level. And I'd usually rather play something meaty. And so far, the game definitely hasn't overstayed its welcome. It's never felt like we've been playing too long. Excellent. Now, last week, I showed off uh, my happy box of new DC content, and after spending a healthy amount of time cracking all that shrink and sorting it out into my multiverse box, I finally got two of my expansions to the table. Uh, though really, in this case, they were actually standalones. Um, <laughs> okay. Now, first up, it was Teen Titans. Uh, and I've been looking forward to this one based on some talk I'd heard, but I have to say, at least in this first play, I was kind of disappointed. Hmm. Um... Now, unquestionably, the first shuffle wasn't as thorough as it should have been in the rush to the table. And again, for those people who haven't played the DC deck builder, the uh, the main deck is uh, around 110 cards. 
So if it, it, you really have to take the time and do a good shuffle to start. Um, now that was part of the problem, but the focus on ongoing cards, which are the cards in DC, which mm -hmm. stay on the table, uh, became tricky to manage. And it was, there was a mm. lot of keeping ongoing cards and then spending ongoing cards and, and the ongoing cards didn't tend to stay ongoing all that long because so many cards required you to spend ongoing cards. And it was really a really fast turnaround of, of what in all the other games, are, you know, basically like a land in magic that you sit out there and they stay there for the rest of the game. Mm. Um, so we also had a real runaway issue. Uh, it wasn't even me. My mm. son walked, uh, you know, walked all over me. Um, and so I'm willing to give it another turn on the table. Uh, and, and hopefully the shuffle was a bigger, a bigger, a, a big enough problem to cause the issue. We'll okay. See, uh, so you said standalone, so obviously you don't need anything, but is it one of those that's standalone, but you can mix everything up? Absolutely. Or does this have some mechanic that nope. makes it completely it's unique? It's 100% compatible, but the box does come with the complete game in itself, and we chose okay. to play We chose to play with just just those portions uh, to begin with, just to, just to see how it played. So do you think it might be better for those, I forget the term, the ongoing cards, if it was mixed with the rest of the games, if it was kind of watered down a little? It might actually, um, and again, it might even have been watered down with a better shuffle. Again, sure. it's hard hard to say. Uh, it may have just been the way the the way it all it all fell out in the uh, in the game, but uh, we'll see. Sorry, right. um, you had another one, and then yeah, uh, next up, my daughter and I got the Heroes Unite box to the table, uh, and this one felt more familiar. Uh, the real difference in it is you're using a B list set of heroes. Okay. Um, so not your Superman and your Wonder Woman, you're using your, you know, your Booster Gold and your Shazam. <laughs> Although these days Shazam isn't as B level well, yeah. as it used to be. Uh, and now the composition of the main deck, interestingly, is weighted towards hero and villain cards more than superpowers and equipment. Okay. Which I thought was a nice little thematic shift. It, it doesn't, it's not a huge deal, but it's, it's enough of a shift Whereas in the main deck, it's really equipment and power heavy okay. because Batman and Superman are equipment and power heavy. Uh, now, I did pull out a resounding win against her, but that wasn't, I would, wouldn't have called it a runaway. Uh, I think if okay. we had a couple of extra villains, we, we chose the basic eight to start with. Uh, if we'd played a 12 villain game, she could have come back and, and taken it because her deck got, uh, got up to speed a little bit later than mine. Um, and that was really uh, all that happened there. Sounds fair. Yeah. Confrontations when we played it, I noticed it was definitely more heroes and villains than anything else in the deck. Like we didn't, like you had mentioned that the equipment tended to be themed to the characters. And I'm like, I totally missed that. <laughs> so you've only played both of these two player there. They do play more. These yeah, aren't like absolutely. the dual nope, deck. Have, uh, we'd actually planned on playing Heroes Unite three player, but uh, okay. someone came over and my son uh, bailed. Yeah. So it was just my daughter and I. <laughs> fair enough. Uh, for me, I've got one more. Uh, that is another game I got at Origins, and that is Sorcerer from White Wizard Games. Uh, this past Saturday, I actually did a demo night for Sorcerer at the CG Realm. Uh, this was part of their regular twice-a-month tabletop night. Um, Ian, one of the store people, was going to be off due to his husband's birthday and pride going on and stuff like that. So I agreed to run a Sorcerer night at the CG Realm and run demos of it. Now, what was cool is I showed up and local gamer Steve Singleton also brought his copy, which his was the like, shiny Kickstarter copy. As far as I could tell, it didn't look any different, but he had like bonus uh, extra cards and stuff. He didn't, it didn't look any physically any better than mine, which is I appreciate because I missed out on the Kickstarter. Uh, what was cool is he was offered to run a second table. So we had two games of Sorcerer going simultaneously through the night. Now, I personally only ran two demo games. Now, those of you who heard last week's show might wonder why you only ran yeah, two well, demos of the game. So I sat down, right? And I'm getting the game set up and the gamers are showing up. Like I got there just a little bit early, just before five o'clock and people were, one person was already there and people started gathering because they knew I was going to be teaching Sorcerer, right? Uh, one of the people tech who uh, must be working tonight or else he'd be in the chat room uh, definitely told me he wanted to play it. So I was ready to set down me and Kevin and we're going to, I'm going to do a demo of Sorcerer. And I plan to do a short two player demo, just like I got from Rob when I was at um, their booth at Origins. He gave me a little 15 minute kind of show me the game, show me how it works. Right. And I thought I'd do a bunch of demos of it. 
But you know what? The local gamers just were having none of that. Um, like, everyone was like, no, I don't want to see a demo. I want to play the full game. And especially with Steve being there, they're like, well, let's do a full game here and a full game there. You got two copies. So I'm like, all right, I guess. Uh, the problem, too, though, is I really wanted to show off the two-player game, right? And there were too many people for that. And we ended up having eight people that wanted to play Sorcerer. So we're like, okay, I guess we'll check out the four-player rules. Well, gamers get a game. <laughs> now, the reason I was hesitant is this game is supposed to be best with two players. Everything says this is a two-player game that happens to have other rules. Uh, Board Game Geek has it listed as best of two. The rules are literally written, this is a two-player game, and in the back are some variants for three or more players. Uh, even Rob from White Wizard Games noted that this was designed to be a two-player experience, but you can play multiple players and show me how it works. Um, to be honest, I actually had to sit there and say, hold on. I'm going to pause setting up the game so I could read the rules because I hadn't even read the rules to play four players. Like I think I did when I first opened the game, but like not any time recently. So I made it clear to everyone playing. I'm like, oh, hey, look, we're going to play four players, but don't like let this sway you if it's not great because the game's supposed to be really good with two. So just so you know, we're playing without the recommended players here. Uh, so no one's going to listen to you uh, if you after you say we're going to play. So it's yeah. or not, you know, <laughs> fair enough. Um, so I went through the back of the book and I, I literally paused the game night so I could read the rules and I decided to pick, I picked the team rules for four players and I gotta say it played well, like well enough that I don't get why everyone seems to be insisting it's a two player game, including like one of the lead developers, uh, we're playing with four player games. You set it up as if you're playing a two player game. You're still battling over three locations. The winner's the first to destroy two of them. Uh, turn order is a little weird. So, like, your team goes, then my team goes. But between the two of us, it's the player who has the most actions left that has to go. And if you both have the same actions, then you can actually like, talk about it and decide who gets to go, which is kind of weird and unique. I've never seen that before. Like, I usually go, I go, you go, you go, you go type of thing, which didn't really work for the podcast because it's pointing. But it's usually my team, your team, the other person on my team, the other person on your team. It wasn't that. It was your team goes, I go, and you kind of decide who goes sometimes. Well, hopefully that turn order plays out much more easily than it's described. <laughs> To be honest, it was actually kind of a highlight of the game because there was some really neat tactical moments where it made more sense to let one team member go before another because you were allowed to freely communicate and show each other their cards. And like sometimes it'd be like, oh, wait, sometimes it was worth delaying, right? It'd be like, here, you go first because I want to see what the other team's going to do. And then I can react to what they're doing. Like it, it was it, it came up during multiple times in both of the games I ran. Now, the other change with teams is that you can have six minions, six summons, think, because this is a Magic-style game, battling at each location instead of four. I got to say that didn't seem to have a lot of impact, though we did fill most of the zones by mid-game, but I found that when we played two players, usually most zones were filled by mid-game. So that didn't seem to impact the four-player versus two-player experience. Though it did make cards that affect everything in a zone to be a little more powerful. Not in a game-breaking way, just, hey, these cards are a little better than they would have been in a two-player game. Now, Steve's demo games also feature four players. Uh, by the end of the night, both of us agreed we couldn't find a good reason not to recommend Sorcerer at two or four players. Like, I, I don't know why everyone on Board Game Geek is saying two-player only, because it played fine. Now, you mentioned you chose the team rules for the four-player games. Are there other variants, and are people considering the team rules as a two-player game because it's two teams and not four separate players? Uh, possibly because there are other variants. There is um, a free-for-all version where instead of battling over three spots, you, put, you can play up to six players this way, which you put a battlefield between each player, and then you can only fight on the battlefields to your left and right, which kind of reminds me a bit of like Seven Wonders or Between Two Cities. And what happens in that, though, is when a battlefield's destroyed, it just the battle starts over again. And the person who destroyed it gets one point. And the first player out of all up to six that gets three points wins. It sounds a little weird. I do like the focusing on my left and right. That part sounds kind of neat. Uh, but I haven't tried it. So I couldn't tell you any more. And then there was... That might have been, I think there might have been one other variant, but again, I hadn't even read the rules before we started that game night. 
But we definitely have not tried the free for all or battle royal or whatever they call the one man against everyone else mode. Yeah, it sounds. I suspect uh, from your descriptions that there the people aren't considering the team mode as four player, uh, and so they're I looking guess. at free for all and free for all with four players may may not be enjoyable. Yeah, maybe can't, that's not. Can't say. Uh, and that and that's sort of what they're uh, they're judging it on. Yeah, so this is another one you're going to see a full review on, and one of the things I'm going to make sure I do before I do publish that review is try the free-for-all mode at least once. I Actually, I think it sounds cool for a three-player mode. I don't know once you get the four or five. And once you get up to that's the other thing worth noting, I think, is um, I can't play four-player free-for-all with my copy of the game on its own because it only comes with... No, it comes with four battlefields. It could. I couldn't do the six player because the, the, the base game only comes with four battlefields. Right. I could do the four player. I couldn't do five or six with just one core set, which isn't surprising because I think the box even says it's one to four players. And it wouldn't be the first board game that's like, you can double the player count by buying another box. Right. Uh, and now, how about a look ahead? What have you got planned for the coming week? Oh, this coming Saturday, August 17th, we've got our third game night at Easy Mode. Uh, for that, I'm planning to break out Tower of Madness. Uh, that is the Cthulhu Kerplunk game that actually looks to be much more of a game than I was first expecting. Still have not even tried it, so this will be the first time I'm breaking that game out. I am really looking forward to playing some more Chocolatiers. So one of the things we often get at Easy Mode is new gamers. So that's one of the games I'm going to bring as a gateway game to hopefully show some new gamers and to get some more plays in. I'm thinking about grabbing Horizons as well because I need to play that for five with five players before I can finish the review on that. Now, the week after that, August 24th, of course, is our big Extra Life Warm event. Uh, we talked about this earlier. I am looking forward to lots of gaming, 12 hours of gaming, 12 hours, I don't know about straight, but pretty close to straight, might break for dinner or something at some point, or some Coney dogs. And I'm looking forward to Sean being in town for that event. Absolutely. Uh, and I'm looking forward to uh, testing out uh, our abilities to stream major <laughs> events. Uh, and not just the little personal ones we've been doing. So that's going to be that's going to be fun for everyone, I hope. Uh, and I still have more expansions uh, from <laughs> DC. Uh, and I uh, I'm going to take a look around and see uh, if there are any copies of the new ex expansion yeah. that just dropped uh, a week I ago. I did. I did see CG Realm did have it on Saturday when I was there. So. It's it must be in stores. Yeah, well, um, it, you know what? I'm going to check out my local FLGS, and uh, depending on what they've got, uh, maybe I'll wait until the 24th and uh, pick up a copy down to, down there. All right, so we got a review. We talked about a giveaway, and we did our week in review. We should have stopped at the lobby somewhere in the middle there. I think I lost that in the notes. So what do we got going on? I do see you got Cat really excited <laughs> by your DC talk. Yeah, no, Kat is, Kat's a DC lover, absolutely, and uh, she too loves Heroes Unite. It really is. Nice. Uh, I, again, I think right now, so far, it's my favorite standalone expansion, expansion as well. Uh, she's pointing out that she likes to be Booster Gold, so she can be annoying <laughs> as a character. Uh, <laughs> but uh, So would Heroes Unite be better than the base game? Um, I don't know about better. But uh, on par with, I think. I, it, okay. Again, I, I, I say right now, I'm saying it's my favorite expansion standalone right. so far um i still really enjoy the base game uh it's it's they're 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 close enough that i don't okay. i think that's part of the fun of it is that they really are close to be closest to being the same game so basically if someone was going to get new into it would those be the two you recommend and then base it on which heroes they want to play yeah i mean if you want if you want to play the heavy hitters get dc and if you want to play someone a little less familiar to you hop in there and get heroes unite absolutely very fair. Um, what I, I see, Deanna is looking forward to trying a sorcerer four player. Yep, we'll have to try and get that. See if we can we can get something together when uh, when I'm down there and, and do a see if we can get a four player. Yeah, that's not a bad idea. Or even a, or even just a three free for all. Um, yeah, I, I got to like, get a three free for all at some point. I don't know about four free for all, but at least a three. Yeah. So. And uh, she's saying, and she games is saying that Sorcerer's got a steep learning curve because of the, yes. uh, the possible number of possible combos. Yeah, that's I, I'm not I haven't got to the point where I'm going to write the final review, but it's definitely not for everyone. Um, yeah. It's almost I, it's quite as bad as Magic as a lifestyle game, but it's it's that style of game. It is a learn your deck, learn the combos, 
you can master it. Reward system mastery. A player who knows what they're doing is probably going to beat a player who doesn't. And that first couple plays, you're going to spend way more time just reading your hand of cards and trying to figure out what the hell to do with them than you are going to be like playing good. It's it's that kind of game. But that's what it's designed to be. So if you're that type of player who likes competitive dueling card games, it may be the game for you. That's, that's again, after only two plays. That's not my final thoughts, but they may reflect what my final thoughts are. Uh, Angie Games is mentioning as an honorary mention for Gateway Gaming for the Queen as an intro to that newfangled shared storytelling RPG. <laughs> she didn't call them newfangled hippie games, but yes. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I agree. got to agree. Uh, for the Queen, if you want an improv, past-the-stick style role-playing experience, I think is a fantastic intro to improv role-playing, where no prep, no DM, just sit down, just start playing, and end up telling a rather engaging, not even a story, building some rather engaging characters is probably the best way to describe that game. Yeah, we uh, Deanna and I had a short chat about that, about how this topic was very board game focused and we should have an RPG version. And then a couple things came up. One, I think that's enough to be a whole other show. And two, that's not a show I can do. I don't know the new hotness in RPGs. For the Queen, I happen to know about <laughs> because some great people taught it to me at Queen City Conquest, but I am not anywhere near the cutting edge like, like we talk about um, not being about the new hotness and being about the new hotness from 2010. When we're talking RPGs, we're talking new hotness from 1985. <laughs> For, you know, when did Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay come out? I could talk about Warhammer 3rd Edition. That's still, I don't know, that came out in year 2000, maybe. I haven't played fifth edition D and D, right? So I, I, yeah, I I'm, I'm a second, I'm a second dad uh, D and Der, so. <laughs> yeah see like i i couldn't do that show i i think it's a cool topic we could talk about it but i definitely won't be talking from a position of expertise which is what i try to do on this show yeah. i can't do that for RPG. i can't tell you I, I probably couldn't even name well i could probably name rpgs that came out in the last three years but like gateway rpg when did fate core come out there's a gateway rpg there you go there tales from the loop came out in 2017 but again i played it i, I haven't read it i bought it yep no, sorry. Uh, the the beginner box for Shadowrun Fifth Edition is not a good gateway game. <laughs> I can tell you that. And just don't go near FASA Smash of the Universe. <laughs> yeah. That gateway advance doesn't matter. Just don't go near. Ma yeah, FASA, just just FASA don't. Don't. Someone again is tuned in this late in the show and is like, "Oh, FASA, <laughs> don't do it." All righty. Thank you, those of you in the chat, for engaging with us tonight. It's been awesome tonight. And now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our Patreon backers. Their support helps make this show possible. P.S. Goujon. Thanks. Andrew Dacey. Thank you. Diane Tuzano. Thanks, Ma. Misdirected Mark. Join Phil, Chris, Bob every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern as they talk games and game mastering. Where'd Central come in there? I first don't time? even know. Like, like that's, that's never been. <laughs> 6 p.m. Central. the Queen's time. Yeah. Is the Queen's time Central? And he, it just psychically... No, I, th I, I think I've been watching TV or something. 8 p.m. Eastern Central, right? It was always the same. Oh, yeah, you say Eastern Central, yeah. Oh, yeah. Anyway, 8 p.m. Uh, Roger Malosh, thank you. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end. You're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can also find us on Board Game Geek as guild number 3347. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing at all and would like to support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop gaming podcast to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. You can also catch the, tabletops, the Bellhop's Tabletop Twitch Friday nights at 8.30. We mostly play Gloomhaven, but now and then we'll surprise you with something else. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. Hang around and join us in the Pendo Suite for the Off the Books After Show. And at the end, we'll be rating another board gaming channel. Yes, there is something we need to put into our show notes to remember. So this is a new feature, all right? For those of you joining live, at the end of the show, after we sat and chatted with you awesome folk in the chat room, 
we are going to do a Twitch raid of another board gaming channel. Just a great way to share the love for other tabletop streamers out there. But for now, for Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on.